Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to listen to my talk about EBPF. How excited about you, are, are, are you about this topic? Woo! Yeah, thank you. So, the first time I met this EBPF thing, I will present myself later. I like to present myself at the end of the slides so that you listen to what you like first. So the first time I've seen like this term popping out on the internet like two years ago, I was like, what is that? And my brain was like, do you really want to learn that? It's something that we should do together. And I was, yeah, I want to do that, brain. So please, let's Google something to understand what is that. And it turns out that this thing is nothing really new. I mean, it's just, Berkeley packet filters that they didn't know anything about, so even better. And, but they are extended, so they have something more. So the basic meaning of Berkeley packet filter is that they are some utility that lets you, as the name say, to filter packets. And I said, well, so that's just for networking. And it turns out it's not. So if you are confused about that, it's not just for networking, it's for Particularly, it's basically for everything. But we'll get, we'll dig that a bit, in that a bit more. So, what I like to say is that BPF is actually a tracing framework. Um, tracing framework is basically something that you can use an instrument to actually extract information from a system, right? It's actually not just that, in a sense that you can actually create entire programs with BPF, so you can basically not just instruct information, but also um, write programs to do actual stuff. Like, for example, there's a framework built on the BPF that's called XDP. I will explain that a, a, bit, a bit of that later. That actually allows you like, to drop packets that are coming to your network stack even before and the actual kernel knows about that. How mind-blowing is that? And BPF is actually used to access um, kernel tracing backends. Um, what that means is that uh, BPF is not the actual thing that extracts information from the kernel. It actually leverages um, other tools to extract, to, to extract the information, other kernel functions. Those are actually Static trace points. Static trace points are just um, some actual points in the kernel where you can actually extract information from, and they have been coded into the kernel directly. So they are just there, right? Um, you can see how they are by extracting that information from this file here. And for each one, you have like a set of information you can extract from it. Like, for example, for TCP, you can extract the retransmissions. For virtual file system, which is the actually uh, place where everything, every file is, um, where its actual function that is called every time a file is written, you can actually extract information about like how many bytes this file uh, contained or uh, how many times this function has been called. And then there are like the dynamic trace functionalities, which are like the most interesting because it, they are the actual ones that you can use to. Um, extract information from your programs. Let's say you have like Kubernetes, right? And you want to know how many times the main of Kubernetes or some function of Kubernetes is called uh, and which, with, what, with what arguments or what it returned, you can actually use this thing. Um, in the dynamic trace functionalities, we can um, actually um, distinguish three uh, different sources. There's the uprops, the user pros, that's the actual probes that you can write on your program. So you have a binary, you can actually extract information from it, like if it was like running GDB, right? And key probes, kernel probes, where like you just um, go to the actual kernel functions. It's like static trace points, but static trace points have been coded there, while key probes are actually functions implemented in the kernel, and you can actually extract information from them. And then there's Express Data Path that allows you to actually load your BPF programs inside your network cards so that you can program the network card to drop packets to um, understand a little bit uh, the packets before it actually reaches the kernel, which turns to be very convenient if you 
want to drop the packets earlier. Like let's say that you want to ban an IP or you want to ban an IP class. You can just, oh, is this the IP class? XTP drop. But as I said, what I like VPF for is to actually trace events. And I also think that it's better sometimes to actually have a place to aggregate your events even before they actually reach other systems. So that you, like, let's say that you want to know how many times a function is called, right? Or with, like, the sum of the bytes written to a file. You don't want to actually send every byte that's been written to the backend and then sum, like, in, in FluxDB. You want to actually um, have the sum, like, at the kernel level, which tends to be very, very performant. And for those of you that were like asking yourself, how the hell this is done, right? Um, I don't know how every one of you is familiar with the kernel, but actually the ways you have to interact with the kernel are like three. So you can actually write a kernel module, very convenient for everyone, right? So everyone wants to do that and maintain that. Or you can actually leverage the kernel syscalls, but it turns out that you cannot like uh, do whatever you want to it. Like, there's not a syscall for anything. And also, um, like, writing a syscall is complicated if you want to do that. And you can also use NAV filter, NAV link, uh, but it's just for networking still, so that. So then there's another cool thing in town that's eBPFs. So with eBPFs, you can actually load your specific programs. eBPF, um, is a virtual machine, but not in like the classical sense of virtual machines. Like it's not like um, whatever uh, a KVM virtual machine. It's, um, it's just an implementation of an instruction set and of a machine where this instruction set works um, that the kernel used to load your program. So when you write your user program, you actually uh, like uh, you want to write like a little VPF program, you compile it with like a compiler that can actually emit the BPF bytecode, right? So not x86, 64, but a BPF bytecode, like Clang does that. And that bytecode is then uh, sent to the kernel with the BPF syscall. Um, we will see that later. There are like tools that simplifies this, right? It just explains the actual picture. And when you load that program, the kernel receives it in kernel space and analyzes that program. And after analyzing it, like, why, it analyze it? why should it analyze it? Like, just to make sure that you don't kernel panic this machine, right? And when that program is analyzed, then it's loaded in the BPF uh, VM. And it turns out that after doing that, you can actually um, send the information back to user space using BPF maps. There are like any sort of, any kind of map, like you can have like cache maps, lists, whatever, and in that way you can actually stream out information from the kernel, right? It turns out to be very cool. And you can also like take the streams back and like do other things with the streams. So you can actually like uh, use the streams to um, basically uh, instrument your pro like that this is the list of IPs I want to block. You put those in a map and maybe with the same BPF program you find new IPs to block and you write them in a map again so that they're blocked the next time. But hey what are those used for? Like you're saying all this stuff to us and it seems that we never met that. It's turns out to not be actu actually true because you use TCP down, right? And who uses it? Raise your hands. Cool. Pretty popular, right? And TCP dump actually emits BPF bytecode when you actually want to analyze your packets. So you're actually using BPF like every week at least or every month. You just have to pass to TCP dump this parameter and it will show you the actual instructions that it's sending to the BPF VM to, to actually dump out your packets. Um, I'm not like a JD of the BPF bytecode, just like not how I am for x 64 because there are compilers, but I've been trying to uh, write down notes on the actual bytecode that I got from this 
TCP dump instruction. And it turns out that they wanted the IP, the IP stack, uh, and on, then TCP protocol, and on port 80, which turns out to be HTTP usually. And basically, what I got is this instruction says, is this an, in, an Ethernet IPv4 packet? Yes. So that when instruction passes, it goes to the next one. And is the, the SRC port, the source port on 80? Yes. And the destination? Yes. So by looking at this thing, you can actually understand if you wrote the right, the BP, uh, the, the right TCP dump line in your TCP dump so that you can actually see what it does. And there's more. like. You use Kubernetes, right? You use containers and everything. And it turns out that one of the features that allows containers to actually be there is SecComp, right? SecComp, the Parmor, and all the Linux security module you might want to use. SecComp is used in Kubernetes in Docker containers or containers or whatever engine you want to use um, to actually uh, filter the syscalls your container can do to the machine so that the container basically cannot become the uh, network administrator and by extension the root on the, on the container, right? It turns out that in SecCom to do, fil to do filtering, you just, mm, like you can do like basic filtering, like I just want to block the Cisco, but you can also write actual BPF programs that actually have logic inside so that you can basically define your logic. Like if the process is called Lorenzo, just Drop it. I don't want Lorenzo processes there. This kind of things. It's very cool. More practical examples. You can actually use it to uh, trace file opens by file name, for example. I'm not training all those, the, just the one I, I, I think are meaningful. Like extract go runtime events. That's what I do a lot. Uh, I do a lot for Kafka to extract JVM events. You actually want to know what the JVM is doing. You can actually um, let's say that you have a database, whatever database you have, and you want to actually know all the queries executed in that database and maybe how much the query took uh, to, to execute, you can have to use a new probe to actually go there and take the query and then like analyze the time span between the query was uh, entering the function and the query was executed, right? And you don't even need to actually tell the, the, the actual developer of uh, the database that you're doing that. And it doesn't seem a big deal now that you're all living open source, but you really want to modify like the InfluxDB source just to get out that information or the MySQL source or whatever it is. And it's also a big deal for those of you that might use like a closed source database because you can actually, or well, closed source software or whatever, because you can actually go there and understand what the programmer was, was doing there with the code. Hey, yeah, this was intensive, right? I've seen many people yawning, so. But there are high-level APIs out there, so you can actually just forget whatever I said. No, I'm joking. Uh, you can actually just take whatever I said and put that in your knowledge base so that you understand what's going on under the hood, but then you actually use something that's easier. There's um, group in the kernel that's called IOVisor that actually makes higher level tool for all of us to use so that we don't all have to understand the stuff. And that group made the thing called IOVisor BCC, BPF Compiler Collection. That's actually a repo that contains a lot of examples, documentation, and whatnot, um, programs that you can actually just take and run. Um, and it also has um, a lot of abstractions on the kernel resources so that you can actually have something that already loads a program for you or something that already takes care for you for your maps. And it turns out that it has Go BPF, which is actually like a library to use BCC in Go that you can use to like convert the map into a channel so that you have something asynchronous that sends you the matrix you extract from the kernel. This program here may be a, a bit confusing, but in the slides, in, when I share the slides, it's going to be easier. In this case, for example, what it's doing is that there's some main function. I hope everyone can read it. And this main function is loading this bash readline file here. It, that is this one. 
and after some boilerplate to actually uh, cre cre instantiate BPF, uh, go BPF and everything, what it does is that it attaches to this get return value here, um, and it attaches that function, that's my BPF program, to the read line function in the kernel. In that way, I can actually dump out every single uh, bash command that's done in this machine where I'm running this. And I receive all of that in um, channel here, in a go channel that they can then consume to do whatever I want. And after having that, like I'm just printing that in the, in the console, but they could send it to like um, database or whatever, like an InfluxDB, um, to actually analyze that and maybe understand if there's maybe any malicious program running in my machine. Someone like took my machine and started running bash commands, I, I see that, right? And I didn't, even, I, I didn't have to actually modify the bash, pro, the bash uh, executable to do that. I just slowed this thing. Some of you might wonder, what's the difference between this thing and actually S-Trace or uh, running a debugger, right? Uh, it turns out that S trace is a good thing, but it actually adds symbols to your program, and like uh, it actually adds um, how to call them. Uh, it, it actually adds trace points to your program that make it slower or make it um, a bit unstable, and even worse, the debugger. And this thing is completely on another level. This thing is uh, very. It's like. A lot more, a lot less um, intrusive for your programs, and actually is very, like, a lot very performant because it actually runs um, separately in the kernel in another place where it has access to everything. And then there's Sciovisor BPF trace, which I'm really excited about because it's an actual DSL, a domain specific language for BPF programs that lets you actually write your BPF programs in a way um, that you don't like to understand, like C or Go or like, is this uh, a thing that loads BPF programs? Is this a clan compiler? Is this BCC? So you just uh, actually call BPF trace and you like here, as we've seen before, you actually attach a trace point to a specific, to the syscalls uh, point to this specific syscall. So you actually you see uh, all the time the sys exit read is called and you actually can um, print out um, the arguments of the syscall. It turns out that um, BPR trace can also produce histograms or uh, do counters, these kind of things. In this image you, I'm not explaining the image itself because it takes time but if you want like, to actually know um, like, where and when things happen in the kernel, just so that you can actually understand where, to, where it's best for you to attach, you can, look at, you can refer to this image that comes from the IOVisor BPF trace repository. So like, um, since I have a daemon and that SKB later, I will just, um, like for example, um, when you load XDP programs that I was uh, saying before, you actually are before all of this, okay? The actual packet hadn't yet reached the kernel, so it's not yet uh, reached with the NetSKB SKB, um, struct. The NetSKB struct is a struct that uh, your packets receive when they reach the kernel, so they um, basically are reached with this struct that adds a lot of burden in that packet because the packet is already, like when, you're, when you have a, a very traffic intensive application, it might be difficult to actually analyze packets in this layer, so you want to analyze them in the network kernel, and that's where you use XDP. While if you wanted to use um, uh, BPF here, you will have to use traffic control, okay? Yeah, well, what about Kubernetes, right? because it's the QECon, so you're saying all this thing about the BPF, why? Turns out that uh, while working at the Influx Datas, um, which were a work, um, CloudOffer, we had 
a lot of performance program, programs in under, we are working on new versions, so everything is new. We are like writing a new storage layer and whatnot. And it turns, turned out that it was like, yes, we are building an observability tool. And while building it, it was a bit difficult to observe it. And it turned out that it's still difficult because you don't know in advance what you want to observe, right? And BPF gives you a way to actually observe what you're interested in now, right? So it's not more, like you can use BPF programs to actually like, decide in advance what you want to observe and observe it for the rest of your life. But it turns out that you can also like, dump there some BPF programs that you want to run now so that you understand. Like, you recognize the Unix philosophy here. Like, you have your Linux machine, or what, what Unix machine you have, and you just want to run like top or uh, VM stat or uh, MB stat or IO top or whatever it is so that you can understand what's going on. And it turns out there's nothing like that for Kubernetes clusters. Um, so I made this thing called kubectl trace that lets you actually run BPF trace programs on your Kubernetes clusters. And the way it works is that it's a kubectl plugin that you just download and put in your path. And once you have it, um, it actually uh, use the same uh, kubeconfig file so that once it can connect to your Kubernetes cluster, it just go there and load the BPF programs in your kernels uh, for the specific machine you want. So in this case, I'm running a key probe on this um, function of the kernel. And I'm printing what it gets as argument one. And I'm doing that on this specific machine, right? And this is just for attaching. Something that might be interesting is like actually um, extracting the um, read syscalls. So like actually seeing the distribution of the read of the files in your machine in this case. Uh, so I just noticed it that most of the files I uh, read are between four and eight kilobytes. And it turns out that's a very specific number. And that's the number that most like TCP and UDP connection use. So if you then analyze um, that um, write syscall, you will see that it actually, on, it actually is on like the Unix socket or the TCP socket or whatever. There are some more complete example here. Uh, you can like uh, pipe uh, QCTL trace to like VZ data so that you can get a different way of graphing your um, your output. Like with VZ data, you can create actual uh, com complex graphs more than like uh, BPF trace does. So I just wanted to to add that here. And there's just time for my demo actually. So. So I have this. Everyone can see my terminal, yes? Cool. So I have this little uh, Kubernetes cluster locally that has just a DNS and some cats on it. So yeah, cats are cool, right? So I just want to actually go to the cats and see them. And this little application just shows you how many times um, it has been called with a counter. And there are three replicas, so you will see three different counters, right? And actually want to extract that specific counter information uh, with BPF instead of like having like to send the, that information to uh, InfluxDB or like to have to change my program to send that information, I just want to extract that information with BPFs. How do I do that? I wrote a one liner here. So basically what you need to do is to run this QCTL program that I'm running now. This program here attaches a URAT probe. I'm not told you about this, right? A URAT probe is a new probe that actually 
uh, gives you also the return value of the function so that you can uh, get whatever the function returned. That there's the same thing for for k probe, k bit probe, right? Attach the URAT probe to proc uh, process ID executable. I'm doing like this because I didn't yet implement the way in QCTL trace to actually go there and understand this. Um, but the, but I'm doing I'm using this path instead of like the actual binary path because it turns out that your containers are uh, contained. <laughs> And so the only way you have to get the binary from the host is, well, you can uh, go to, like to Docker Dim or whatever you use, understand that, but the best way is to actually go to the process ID and just get the executable that you're running. And this is, this main counter value is the actual um, function in my Go program uh, that actually uh, gives you the counter value. So every time that function is called, I receive a notification in my BPF trace program. And I can actually dump you the, this re return value here as an integer. And this is locals because I'm running the, the Kubernetes cluster locally with it because I didn't actually trust the internet here. And I just actually started the program in my cluster so I can Trace get. Um, QCTL trace get shows you all the BPF trace program you have in, all name, in uh, the default namespace in this case. And I could like attach to it with QCTL trace attach. But it turns out that I, I'm already attached to this program because of this parameter. So I can just control C. doesn't work. Yeah, nice. Uh, it doesn't work because I didn't actually call it. So I'm calling it for some times. And it actually is dumping the counters. I'm attaching it only to one of the cathode days, so we will see only one of three. And it turns out that this one was 27. That is precisely the last value I got. This one was 28 and 28. And it was 29. You can go on for the World Conference if you want. You want it? No? You have better things to do? And then you just stop it. And you delete all of them. And it turns out that it doesn't need you to actually have anything more than with what you actually have in your cluster, because it actually uses resources that are like, it uses basically jobs, and it creates them in any space you're saying it to create them. And so you can actually go there and inspect your container with QCTL logs or uh, whatever you want. There's also QCTL trace logs program just as a convenience, but, uh, command as a convenience, but um, it turns out that just playing Kubernetes resource you can understand. And the last thing I want to say to you is that Maybe like there's a lot of lack of resources out there. Um, basically, BPF is just documented in man and in the kernel sources. And there's a lot of good work around from uh, like Cilium and IUvisor. And um, I'm trying to do my mine too. I have a BPF.sh domain. It turns out to be very cool to insert resources there. But there are these two uh, people that are actually writing a book that I would like to recommend because I'm actually in touch with them like to do reviews and to actually see how it's going on. And um, I just want to say that a book is coming soon. So if you're interested in this topic, there will be more material in the next, the next couple of days. And I just want to add some more references uh, of like things that I think are important in this uh, BPF landscape now, so that you can actually go there and like maybe shoot a photo and understand uh, that there's some uh, work going on. Um, I think it's time just to tell you who I am because I didn't tell you in the first place. 
So my name is Lorenzo. I work at Influx Data, the creators of InfluxDB. You probably know it. Um, as an SRV, uh, we are actually um, managing a lot of traffic because we ingest all the points in our cloud offer. And it turned out that I was a bit upset uh, on the fact that they couldn't really inspect uh, my infrastructure. So I just trained doing this stuff. And I started understanding it. And I just wanted to give a talk so that more people can understand that. And the next time I told I say BPF, people doesn't look at me with a scared face. Thank you for coming and listening to me. If anyone wants to contact me, you're welcome. Uh, my work email is lorenzo at influxdata.com. My personal email is lo at ppf.sh.